No Indian can forget the fateful night in February 2019 when Abhinandan Vartaman, Indian Air Force hero, was taken captive in Pakistan. Now, a brand new book actually reveals dramatic details about how his freedom was secured. According to this book, written by veteran diplomat Ambassador Ajay Bisaria, it was the success of India's coercive diplomacy and India's very clear message to the world that if any harm came to Abhinandan Vartaman, the escalation would be serious and would be real. This is only one of the many dramatic revelations, a revelation about which the Prime Minister had once referenced that India and Pakistan had come very close to what he called at a rally, a Katal Kirat, that is captured in this book by Ajay Bisarya, who was expelled from Pakistan in the aftermath of the abrogation of Article 370. The book looks at contemporary issues, at historical details, but also asks the fundamental futuristic question. Can there ever be peace between India and Pakistan? And then the even more philosophical question, does it matter that much to India any longer? There's a lot to talk about with the author of the book, veteran diplomat, expelled diplomat. Let's welcome uh, Ajay Bisaria to the program uh, now. Uh, congratulations uh, to you, uh, Ambassador Bisaria. And um, I was particularly struck by uh, one, of the, one of the openings and closings of the book. The book starts with your expulsion and it ends with your hope that you are not the last listed high commissioner to Pakistan because things have been, of course, uh, in cold freeze uh, for, for several years now since you were expelled. Uh, let's start, though, with the story that's making waves everywhere. The Katal Kidrat reference, this was a sentence used by the prime minister when he looked back at how India secured the freedom, the release of Indian Air Force hero Abhinandan Vartaman, then a wing commander who had spent 60 hours in uh, captivity. Now, what's very, very interesting is your revelations in the book Anger Management, where you reveal how serious India was about escalating matters if any harm came to Vartaman. Abhinandan Vartaman, how this was conveyed in particular to the United States and UK envoys who conveyed it back to their governments and how at one point the Pakistan Foreign Secretary pauses a meeting that she's having with envoys of the P5 countries to say that she has received a message from the Pakistan army that nine missiles are pointed from India towards Pakistan. She also references the increased aggression by the Indian Navy. I don't think this has ever been revealed before, uh, how serious India was about escalating the threat if any harm would have come to Abhinandan Vartaman. Can you talk about that time and the story you tell in your book? Thank you, Barkha, for having me on your show. <clears throat> and thank you for this opportunity. You know, this was a particularly telling episode, I think, in the diplomacy between our countries. And it was a moment when India's uh, coercive diplomacy uh, succeeded in getting an outcome and getting an outcome very fast. And uh, I think uh, the evidence uh, has been around, but what I do is I go into more granular detail, give more color to exactly what was transpiring uh, behind the scenes. Uh, to uh, to tell the reader that uh, what was happening was an episode of coercive diplomacy and a successful one at that in uh, making a point to Pakistan that India would escalate in case uh, the objectives were not met. Uh, we had a case study before this of another Air Force pilot uh, pilot called Nachiketa in 1999, uh, you would be familiar with that story. You covered Cargill so well. And I think there we took a few weeks to get that pilot back. Uh, we had to get the uh, Red Cross involved and, and there were many hiccups at that point. There was much grandstanding that was going on. In Pakistan, there was a narrative building up that uh, they have an Indian prisoner of war he should be used as a tool for negotiation 
to make India behave in one or the other way. And I think India made that point bilaterally as well as globally that this was non-negotiable. Uh, the, uh, the pilot had to be returned by a deadline or India would escalate. And I think that message went uh, down clearly to Pakistan, which made its change its behavior. Your book also talks about um, the attempt by Imran Khan, then Prime Minister of Pakistan, to reach out to Prime Minister Modi. Uh, a midnight call that comes through Suhail Mahmood, he calls you, a senior Pakistan bureaucrat, then Foreign Secretary of Pakistan, calls you. Uh, he says his Prime Minister would like to speak with Prime Minister Modi. Uh, you write that you check upstairs, you check with your bosses, that a request for a call is evidently declined. Imran Khan is uh, is snubbed. The prime minister sees no merit in having that conversation with him. Can you recall more about that moment? Yes, certainly. And just a clarification, Suhail Mahmood was at that point my counterpart. And the I'm so sorry. I'm secretary. so sorry. I, I'm uh, so sorry. It's so tough was... to keep track of uh, Pakistan bureaucracy, <laughs> but I stand corrected. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. So he was my counterpart uh, in posted in Delhi as high commissioner. And he was then in Pakistan uh, because both of us had been recalled by our governments or been called in by our governments after Pulwama and were part of the uh, you know, decision teams or the action teams in our respective capitals. So I was in touch with him off and on in this period. And he calls me at midnight and says that uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan wants to speak uh, to Prime Minister Modi and would that be possible? And I said, it's midnight, but I still checked. And I reverted and said that, uh, look, our prime minister is not available, but if there's any urgent message, feel free to pass it on to me. I'll ensure it's passed on. And he said, OK, let me go and check back and I'll come back to you. But he never did uh, that night. To, for me, what that demonstrated is that India's message had gone uh, loud and clear to Pakistan about the escalation and Imran Khan was being used uh, for, for the de-escalation. Uh, and uh, it was quite clear that India's asks were clear. Uh, and we had various channels open. So what we wanted was a clear indication that the partner would be, uh, that the pilot would be returned. And we didn't want to enter into negotiation on what India should or shouldn't do uh, to achieve that outcome. So I think uh, uh, that was at that point uh, the decision taken by the Indian government. But can I can I ask you to elaborate just a little more on a riveting passage in the book where you're actually you obviously don't disclose your source, but you say that this was told to you by one of the P5 members, uh, the Pakistan uh, Foreign Secretary. Uh, which was clearly not Sohail Mahmood. The Pakistan Foreign Secretary is talking to envoys uh, in Islamabad, uh, and they're all holed up in this. They're in this huddle, uh, and they're trying to, you know, sort of see what to do next. And she interrupts the meeting, and there is a note from the Pakistan Army, and that talks about nine missiles from India. I'm quoting from the book: nine missiles from India pointed towards Pakistan. How? Seriously, did India consider at that time attacking Pakistan if harm would have come to our Air Force officer? You know, it was obviously quite serious. And the episode I mentioned, which was reconstructed uh, for me by one of the diplomats in there, uh, what they said was that from the 26th, they had been called in multiple times by the Foreign Secretary then um, a lady by the name of Temina Janjua. And she called in these diplomats multiple times. And this was the P3, uh, the US, UK, and France, and were, ha were having conversations. And they were in touch with their capitals. And they were, in fact, on that day, confabulating uh, on the 27th at the residence of the uh, US ambassador when they get a call saying, uh, please come in the evening uh, to meet the foreign secretary. And 15 minutes into that meeting, she interrupts it and reads out and then uh, implores them to raise this issue with their governments uh, because this is a serious threat. Uh, it could escalate the situation. And uh, she asks them to uh, raise this with their governments. And then a lot of diplomacy takes place through the night uh, to uh, try and reassure India 
of Pakistan's intention. Clearly, Pakistan gives an uh, assurance that uh, the uh, Pakistan Prime Minister would make a statement the next day and guarantee the return unharmed of the Indian Parliament. And this message uh, is clearly down. And what India says is, let's see. Uh, let's see if that happens. And uh, so, so India's seriousness in, uh, in taking the next steps to escalation uh, were clear to the world and uh, clear to Pakistan. And that's the nature of a credible threat. It has to be believable. It has to be credible. When Imran Khan uh, goes on uh, television in Pakistan to make the announcement, he almost forgets. Uh, I laughed out loud at this moment uh, in your book. Uh, he almost forgets to make the operative announcement that Abhinandan Vartaman is going to be released. That's that's the first question. He has to be nudged in. The Pakistan army is quite irritated with him. Uh, but Imran Khan's announcement, uh, because so many people didn't know what was actually going on behind the scenes, that that you know this threat of escalation had been made by India. Uh, it was it was described as a peace gesture uh, or, or, a, or a attempt at thawing the situation. Evidently from your book, this was wrong. This was certainly not the case. It was, Pakistan was singing a very different tune till they realized that India was very serious about escalation. Absolutely. And uh, that was a hilarious moment because uh, Foreign Secretary Vijay Gokhale and I were sitting in his room and watching that television screen uh, when Imran Khan was supposed to have made that statement, he ended the speech without uh, making that assurance about uh, returning the pilot. And we were almost getting to our phones to uh, start confabulating on what to do next. When suddenly we saw on the screen the breaking news that Imran Khan offers uh, to send the pilot back. So what really happened, as I learned later, was that Shah Mahmood Qureshi poked him and said, oh, you forgot to say this, or gave him a note in, and he had uh, he was uh, had already delivered his piece and had sat down on his seat. Then he got up again and said, I forgot to say so, and we do it as a peace gesture. Now, the peace gesture narrative is unsurprising because you, know, you have to create a narrative around what you're doing. Uh, you can hardly make the point that uh, we are doing it because uh, we are we are worried what India would do. But again, uh, as in Pakistan with multiple leaks, all this stuff comes out. So it comes out uh, a year later that uh, when a member of parliament says in, uh, in a speech in parliament that in that closed door session that took place for members of parliament, Shah Mahmood Qureshi was present. Imran Khan was supposed to be in there, but for some reason he absented himself. Uh, General Bajwa was with Qureshi, and he said that his legs were shaking and there was sweat on his brow. So, you know, clearly that is the manifestation of a credible threat of force. And, uh, you know, there has also been this account, and your book references it, by a former U.S. Secretary of State, and I think we have that slide, who suggested that he'd been woken up in panic. Uh, and he alludes to uh, how India and Pakistan came very close. In fact, I think the phrase he uses is too close uh, to a nuclear conflict. Uh, can, I, can I ask you, uh, how serious was that danger? I think in your book, you say, uh, of course, I'm talking about uh, Mike Pompeo, never give an inch. Uh, but in your book, you say that the Americans inflated uh, the danger and also their own role in diffusing it. I think so. I, I think uh, Mike Pompeo mentions there was a, a fine U.S. role played in trying to defuse the situation. But India had issued a credible threat. The Americans had amplified it. And, uh, you know, uh, what uh, Mike Pompeo said uh, was that uh, when External Affairs Minister Sushma Suraj spoke to him, she spoke about a nuclear uh, danger. And uh, therefore, he called up uh, General Bajwa on the other side spoke to him and Bajwa denied there was a nuclear danger at that point of time. Uh, don't forget that Pakistan's uh, nuclear uh, committee had met, uh, uh, you know, a couple, uh, on the day of Balakot and made a point that they were meeting. Mm -hmm. But it was not a 
uh, real or a, a, a credible uh, threat at that point of time. But uh, the U.S. certainly played a role. It may be somewhat exaggerated by Pompeo's uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of memoir, but it was certainly uh, a role where, uh, apart from the bilateral threat, the credible bilateral threat, there was uh, also global diplomacy that was successful. But the prime minister, later, looking back at this incident, when Abhidan and Vartaman is safe home uh, to a hero's welcome, uh, at a campaign rally, uh, talks about how a Qatal ki raat was narrowly avoided. That had Pakistan and had Imran Khan not uh, pragmatically released Abhinandan Vartaman, even though he tried to dress it up as if it was his own idea. Uh, and, and we now know from so many details in your book that this was clearly a response to India's very serious intent uh, to, to attack Pakistan if needed, if it came to that. This Qatal ki raat reference suggests that India was ready to go all out. I'm not using the N word. I'm not talking about a nuclear uh, conflict, of course, that was, as you said, stated by the Americans. Uh, but what was the thinking when you when you look at that comment by the prime minister, even though said in the context of a campaign rally, there is a there is a subtext of a very real comment there about what, what the thinking actually was in Delhi. I, as as an analyst, I would say that that shows that the political leadership was prepared to take the next step of escalating a response uh, to the crisis in case the objective of uh, the return of the pilot was not met. So uh, this was uh, clearly something uh, that uh, was clear to the political leadership. And uh, perhaps uh, it was something that was an instruction uh, to the military that was available. Uh, but uh, whatever it is, uh, the fact is that India had issued a threat uh, which Pakistan believed was a genuine one, which the world believed was a genuine one, and as a result of which uh, the pilot was returned. You know, a past uh, NSA, Brijesh Mishra, whom you and I know well, he used to say that when uh, during Operation Parakram, that when you issue a credible threat of force, it should be credible enough for you to believe in it yourself, that you are about to take that action. So I would simply put it that way, that yes, India believed it was about to take that action, and Pakistan believed that that action would be taken. The, the reference to the nine missiles pointed at Pakistan comes from the Pakistan Foreign Secretary and the Pakistan Army. You don't directly comment on how far India was ready to go. And of course, I don't want you to give away anything operational, but how far were we ready to go? And looking back, I'm going to ask you the same uh, question again, because it's always asked in the India-Pakistan conflict, in any, from Kargil to now, is, was there a danger of a nuclear flashpoint? You know, I would frame it exactly the way I did in the book, which is, as far as I was aware, I've given the evidence of what Pakistan said uh, initially privately and then later even in its public communication that nine missiles were about to be uh, sent to them. So I have no way of uh, uh, knowing it or verifying it and nor did I attempt to do so and nor should I know because uh, the way this information is treated, it's on need to know basis. There is no need for an Indian High Commissioner uh, to know exactly what an operation plan is. But uh, I think the point really is a strat uh, strategic one that India said at that point of time that it was ready to escalate the crisis in a credible, believable way. Okay, let's talk about uh, the Pulwama terror attack that actually led to all of these developments taking place. Now, what is very interesting in your book, and this is familiar to me as a, you know, a long time student of pa India-Pakistan relations, this kind of division or perceived division within the Pakistan establishment every time it comes to an attack on India. So in Kargil, we wondered, did Nawaz Sharif know what Musharraf was up to? In your book, interestingly, you wonder whether the Pakistan army chief uh, uh, was on board fully with Pulwama or whether this was an ISI plan. And I want you to talk a little bit about uh, you know, what gave you that impression or what, what gave you, uh, what led you to asking those questions? 
Well, as I understand it, and from the experts on the Indian side and some conversations with the Pakistani side, that in the it's in the nature of these operations which are run by non-state actor organizations. Uh, it's it's not a very clear-cut proposal on what to, is to be done. And the uh, NIA investigation of 18 months also uh, seems to suggest that uh, it was uh, perhaps planned to be a smaller operation. It became uh, bigger than it was. So within that, there would be a speculation amongst the uh, security community that perhaps uh, it would have been a, a generally approved direction it to go in to keep creating some trouble in uh, Kashmir. But whose desk uh, did it go to, the actual operation to be approved, is, is not something I am privy to and I can only speculate uh, mm -hmm. that uh, perhaps it didn't uh, go to the army chief. Yeah. You, you also... Uh sort of make a reference to the Bajwa doctrine. Was there a point at which Bajwa as Pakistan army chief wants to change uh, sort of the entrenched proxy war approach to India? Uh, Bajwa famously meets Pakistani journalists off record and even indicates this, that look, we're bankrupt. We've, we've got to change tack. And later journalists whom we both know well, Nasim Zehra, Hamid Meir among them, ask for him to be court martialed. Do you believe there was a Bajwa doctrine? There was certainly a Bajwa doctrine, but an evolving Bajwa doctrine. You know, the thing about Pakistan army chiefs is that somewhere in the middle of their term, uh, after a year or two years, the ISPR, which is their public relations uh, agency, tries to put across a doctrine and to, you know, kind of position themselves, them as leaders with a vision and they try to make a statement. And, you know, recently an Asim Muni doctrine has been made public. I, I, so, I, I have questions about that also, but go ahead and complete your point. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Bajwa had that doctrine. It did talk about uh, peace with the neighbors. And it uh, did later talk about, and, uh, you know, we uh, the media was adding elements to it, that it wanted an apolitical or neutral army. And... Uh, it wanted then later uh, emphasis on geoeconomics, which means that let's fix our economy rather than obsessing about uh, our political existence. So there was a Bajwa doctrine, a Bajwa vision of sorts, and particularly an army chief who rules that country for six years would have notions about where he wants to take Pakistan and how he wants to deal with India. But I think uh, all uh, that uh, in Bajwa's case, I would call him a very hesitant reformer because he would very easily go on to the default position of dealing with issues or just letting them be. Uh, he was not a decisive uh, visionary leader. In he that. was not a Musharraf style risk taker, basically. Exactly, exactly. So he was a cautious man and he wouldn't really uh, walk the talk till the end. Now, Ambassador Bissaria, what's very interesting in your book is uh, this idea that the Pulwama Balakot matrix actually flips something in Pakistan till the abrogation of 370. And we'll get to that. But actually, after Pulwama terror attack, India strikes back, Abhinandan comes home. Your book suggests that Pakistan is then keen to pick up the pieces. And what's interesting is that Asim Munir, who is presently the Pakistan army chief, then the head of the ISI, is through kind of mediator, somebody close to him, sending you feelers about this, sending you feelers about the fact that Pakistan actually wants to end the long project of terrorism in Kashmir. Uh, how credible did you find that message from Munir, if I may call it that? I think it was a reasonably uh, credible message, but don't forget at that point, he was the sort of deputy of Bajwa. So whether he was articulating the Bajwa doctrine or what his boss had told him, uh, and whether it was a, a posture taken with the not too much reality, or whether he genuinely believes in it, I think the jury is still out on where he stands on that. But certainly Bajwa, uh, believed uh, and said so in private conversations and public conversations that 
this was not a strategy, particularly in the wake of uh, uh, Balakot, that had helped Pakistan, that had been in the interest of Pakistan. And, you know, the low-cost proxy war, which the army had favored as something that had been useful for them, was no longer a useful uh, tool because the cost of it had gone up after Balakot. So I think uh, there was a certain rethink on it, uh, whether that rethink was interrupted by Article 370 or uh, whether that rethink itself was so hesitant that it couldn't be carried through. That is something that analysts must study. I, I, and uh, I know I have just a few more minutes left, but quickly on this one point, uh, you know, the rethink went so far at that point as suggesting that, you know, if there was a swearing in where SARC leaders were invited, Imran Khan would be happy to attend. They were quite sure that Mr. Modi was going to win it again. Uh, they wanted uh, Imran Khan to attend the SEO meet in India. So it was a pretty big rethink. Yes, I, I would argue it was. And uh, they were uh, certainly uh, at Bajwa's prodding. Perhaps Imran Khan uh, was believing in it. But then Imran Khan, after Article 370, uh, ran away with the talking points, the initial talking mm -hmm. points, yeah. and did not uh, you know, have the experience or capacity to nuance that position. You know, he shut a door. Uh, which should have left been left a little ajar. And the argument is that at that point, Bajwa was uh, interested in his extension, so he wasn't following the file very closely. So Imran Khan uh, perhaps uh, ran away with that and led to a situation where uh, Pakistan's subsequent leaders could not reverse that position, that we can't talk to you until Article 370 is reversed. Now, strange things happen even between adversarial uh, nations. In the past, Indian intelligence uh, helped Musharraf uh, when a Jeshe Mohammed, uh, uh, you know, sort of strike was targeted against him. Your book reveals that there was a tip off uh, from the ISI to you about an imminent Al Qaeda attack in Kashmir. Talk about that. Yes, so that was, I think, a very interesting development. And I uh, took from it uh, the lesson that uh, Pakistan perhaps was not interested uh, or did not specifically want another Pulwama. Uh, what happened was that there was a tip off that came to me. Now, it's not unusual for Pakistan to tip off India uh, or uh, India to tip off Pakistan. These things happen outside the public domain uh, between intelligence agencies for various reasons at various points. But to escalate it to the political level of the Indian High Commissioner and to say, yes, we've sent it through our normal channels, but we also want you to know, was to uh, flag it politically and make a point that, you know, we, there's something's changing and we don't have the appetite for another Pulwama. So if something like this happens, please don't blame us. I think that was the point uh, that we were seeing, uh, that uh, Pakistan was trying to make it clear to India and perhaps also the world uh, that uh, it was not favoring uh, continuing this terrorism indiscriminately. Finally, I mean, I could talk to you for hours about India-Pakistan, but I know you're uh, you're a much wanted man today in terms of interviews. So finally, finally, let's talk about your expulsion, the present. So we have we have Pakistan attempting this rethink post Balakot, post Pulwama. Uh, this tip off happens. This is, I think, in in, in June. Uh, 2019 and then August 5th happens and 370 is gone and everything changes in Pakistan's response to India. You are asked uh, to leave uh, and you discover that technically you are the first high commissioner to have been expelled in this manner because uh, previously Vijay Nambiar was actually uh, withdrawn. Now what happens? Now we are in a situation where Imran Khan is out. Um, Shah Mahmood Qureshi is out, Nawaz Sharif is in, he's making a lot of peace noises. However, however, as you write in the, towards the end of your book, uh, there is a diminishing uh, sort of interest in Pakistan. In fact, I think you, you quote Shiv Shankar Menon to say it's a Pakistan secular slide into irrelevance. This is now a one issue relationship and that is of, of security from an Indian perspective. You also quote Steve Cohen, uh, who spoke about how India and Pakistan may be shooting for a century. How do you see things today? Well, in a flux. 
I think uh, the fact that Pakistan is going through a poly crisis at this point with the underlying economic crisis, the you know sins of the past coming home to roost altogether, uh, is makes it a very difficult challenge because uh, Pakistan is now going through internal turmoil. And uh, from a policy point of view for India, there is uh, very little coherence in what is happening in Pakistan. But I see 2024 with uh, cautious hope because uh, there'll be an election in Pakistan, perhaps coherence, perhaps even uh, if it's a selected prime minister in the shape of Nawaz Sharif, he would be in the same pages uh, with the army and a new government in India. New governments coming in is always a time for fresh thinking and uh, looking at issues uh, anew. And I think there is some possibility of uh, some rapprochement uh, during this period. Uh, also, we've gone five years without a major terrorist attack uh, in, in February. And that it's also counts. So I, I, if I was uh, guiding Pakistan, I would ask them to try to become a normal country, to eschew terrorism, to get the economy out of its... Uh, get the army out of its economy, try to normalize and uh, for its own benefit. And within that, uh, it would also benefit with a good relationship that it could establish with its neighbors and particularly India and Afghanistan. But, you know, sorry, just to squeeze in a follow up to that. Nawaz Sharif is currently in step with the army, but the last couple of times he's tried to build relations with India uh, or tried to assert his authority over the Pakistan army chief. He's been shown shown the prison door, literally, or the exile gate. Uh, what makes you think that something might be different this time around? Uh, and, uh, you know, what gives you that cautious hope? Well, because the army needs the Project Nawaz to to extinguish the bad memories of Project Imran. Uh, Imran is still a force within, uh, even from prison, uh, writing uh, pieces for The Economist. And uh, also, I think to be credible, uh, they would need to be supporting uh, Nawaz and uh, letting that continue. Now, there may be a contract uh, uh, with Nawaz that this time he will take the army on board. But you and I know that Nawaz develops a mid-term itch each time uh, where he suddenly realizes that he's not running the country. So if in a scenario that he is in charge, will he... Yeah. He says he'll probably want to live to fight another day. And uh, he would uh, probably uh, want to go on in the short term and take it as it comes later. Well, um, Ajay Bissarya, we didn't get into the weeds of the lashkar e taiba and the jaish e Muhammad, the two terror groups that are on top of uh, India's concerns, dossier after dossier, uh, 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 sort of submitted uh, before Pakistan. Uh, you seem to suggest that before the abrogation of 370, there was some move to arrest jaish e Muhammad operators. Before we uh, let you go, I want to ask you, given that you were expelled after the abrogation of 370, Pakistan has uh, pushed itself into a corner uh, because India is not going to roll this back. The Supreme Court has now upheld this abrog abrogation. What is the face saver available to Pakistan to come back from its position that we won't talk to India given the abrogation? Well, Pakistan can develop several face savers. The Supreme Court in its recent judgment is probably giving them one. Elections in Jammu and Kashmir um, might be a proxy for reversing Article 370. Uh, you know, in India is clear that the uh, its Pakistan policy and Kashmir policy are separate, and mm, Kash Pakistan has no locus standi in uh, Kashmir policy, will which will go on its own steam. But that might give Pakistan a face saver to come out of the little corner that Imran Khan painted it in. Okay, I'm going to say thank you to you. Otherwise, we'll be here for hours. And, and I know you don't have that time. Uh, your book uh, it needs to be read by every serious um, student uh, of this region. Uh, and there was a lot of historical narrative uh, in it, uh, which I didn't have time to touch upon. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Bissari, and congratulations on this book that is climbing up on the bestseller charts with its dramatic revelations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barka. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Take care. 
Mojo Story has always made a commitment to its viewers to go to where the story is. And as you can see here, we are at the epicenter of the Israel war on Gaza. We are right at the front line, about one mile from the Gaza Strip, as is the Israeli military gets ready with its tanks and its gunners to begin its final frontal assault that will take troops into Gaza. As we said, we are not like other organizations. We believe in giving you all sides of the story objectively and as much as possible from the ground. And that's exactly what we're doing here, covering the biggest global story today from the epicenter of the war zone. So please, we need your support. Support us, become a Mojo member, subscribe to us, spread the word and thank you for your support.